Ivan is a doctor, is head of partnerships and external relations at the World Health Organization's Academy Center for Learning and Stimulate and Simulation, which aims to transform lifelong learning in health by incorporating digital and hybrid learning experience to build a more competent health workforce globally. Graduates of York University, Ivan completed her doctoral studies in immunology at the University of Pittsburgh, USA. She then won a prestigious postdoctoral grant from the Cancer Research Institute to pursue research on the immunotherapy of cancer at Marie Curie Institute in France. Her research interest is about global circulation of scientific and medical knowledge and the application of breakthrough technologies to accelerate learning and adoptions of the latest of innovations in medicine, particularly in low and middle income countries. Ivan Mbugu sits on numerous international council. She is an advisor to the top leaders, including the French President Emmanuel Macron, on those presidential council for Africa. She sits since August 2017 with a mandate to inform French policy towards Africa. In addition, she laureates of the next Einstein Forum, Desmond Tutu Fellow of African Leadership Institutes, an elite group of Africa's highest potential young leader, and is also a co-founder of the Young Leaders of the African French African Foundation. Ivan Mbouhou was named among the 100 most influential African by the magazine New African. She has authored many scientific articles, blog, opinion, contributing to the health and science discourse on the African continent. Yvonne, she's an Afro-optimist by nature, personal, professional, intellectual commitment to Africa's emergence, growth, and transformation. It's an, an amazing privilege, a very honor to welcome you with us today, Yvonne. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Xavier. Wow. Uh, that's that's very, very, very kind introduction. Thank you very much. So I uh, noticed that I, I think everybody's in different rooms, different groups. Okay, so streaming to everybody wherever they are. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I am Yvonne Mburu. Um, it's funny because when it comes to saying what I do, I always have a lot of difficulty because as you've clearly heard from my uh, bio, I do a lot of different things. But I was asked to speak today about who I am, what I do and why I do it. And I thought that that's not such a difficult exercise in the end, as long as I just tell the story of sort of how my, my career came to be and, and how I grew up. I'm Kenyan, I'm Franco-Kenyan. Um, I grew I was born and grew up in Kenya and went to school here in primary school and, and high school until I was 18 years old, uh, at which point I went to study abroad. Now, at the time, this was in the year 2000 when I moved to Canada. And at the time, it was fairly common for, um, for students to move abroad for higher studies. Today, it's less common because we have we have a lot more uh, good universities in the region, but at the time there was not as many universities I had been admitted at any rate, I was a, a very good student, so I had been admitted to university, Nairobi University is the most prestigious one here, and I'd been admitted to study medicine, and so I could have chosen to go there, but then my dad really insisted that I go abroad because he believed I was going to get a better education or whatever. So anyway, I moved to Canada. I knew that I wanted to study medicine, biology. I knew that I wanted something around health and science. And so I moved to Canada and I majored in biology and chemistry. And it was, it was fantastic. I actually was very good in those subjects. I was doing great. I, when people ask me what I wanted to do, I usually would say I wanted to do medicine. This is usually was my answer. And it's for a very simple reason. Uh, if you're African, you will know this right away. If you're not, then maybe this is news. All African parents, without fail, want three things, their children to be one of three things, either a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. Anything else is a failure. So, and I said, well, of the three, I think doctors are good. So for me, it was almost like this foregone conclusion that I was going to go into a health field. At any rate, I studied biology and chemistry because in the U.S. and Canadian system, you have to study first a first degree and then go to medical school. You cannot go to medical school directly. And in my third year of uh, university, I entered a lab 
uh, the dean of the Faculty of Science had a very, uh, very uh, fantastic lab where she was studying um, rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease. It's your immune system that attacks basically the cells that are in the bones. And this was the most fascinating thing I'd ever heard in my life. That first of all, that there's such a thing as an immune system which can attack its own body. And I became immediately fascinated with this field. And I studied, I decided actually, I made the decision at that time to rather than go to medical school, to go into graduate school because I wanted now to study immunology. So then I finished my undergrad in Canada. I moved to the US, to the University of Pittsburgh. And I, I decided to do a PhD in immunology. And there, I then understood that there was a link between the immune system, immunology is a study of the immune system, and cancer. And that cancers were very similar in some ways to autoimmune diseases in the sense that cancers are actually the body's own cells that are overgrowing. And for some strange reason, the immune system, which is supposed to be the soldiers of the body, is not able to recognize those cells and kill them. And so every time when someone develops a cancer, it's typically because the immune system has not done its job. And so at that time, this was in the early 2000s. I started graduate school in 2004. Um, so from 2004 to graduate in 2010, at that time, the field of immunology of cancers was very, very new. And uh, there were no drugs at that time. And so it almost was like a group of people who believed very strongly that the immune system was involved, but not very much in terms of therapies, because the therapies that existed for cancer at the time, as you all know, chemotherapies, radiotherapies, surgery, etc. But then in 2010, as I was finishing my PhD in 2011, 2010, 2011, the first immunotherapy drugs were approved in the United States. And there were some really fantastic success stories of people who were, we don't say cured anymore, but we say people whose cancers were in remission for more than five years. So for all intents and purposes, this is the best therapies that there were. And it was such an exciting field to be in. I remember I was, when I finished my PhD, I was looking for a postdoc, a postdoctoral fellowship around the world. I knew for a fact that I wanted to leave the US. I wanted to go to a different place. I wanted to maybe test out a different region of the world. And I ended up at the Marie Curie Institute because I was accepted by a lab that was going to allow me to study immunotherapy. So this is how I ended up in France 10 years ago in 2012 at the Marie Curie Institute, and it really was to study the immunotherapy of cancers. And in this specific case, I was studying bladder cancer. And I had a very nice grant from the Cancer Research Institute in the US. I was very keen on studying this and on being in this really cutting edge area where new treatments are being discovered and new treatments are being used, you know, um, to show that we can actually, we can actually maybe one day beat uh, this awful disease. And so 2012 was my first year in France at the Curie Institute. Life was actually very difficult for me back then because I did not speak French. Uh, the good thing is that in science, the language is English, but it was still very difficult for me. I left all my social networks, all my social cir uh, circles. I left everything I knew really and just moved to France to, to, to do a new program in a, a country I didn't really understand the culture of and everything was really, really, really different. And I remember that year was a really tough year, but it was also a very tough year because uh, my aunt, who's uh, my father's sister, was diagnosed that year with lung cancer. She'd never smoked a cigarette in her life. Uh, but this happens in a small percentage of patients. Um, they actually are not smokers, but they can develop a lung cancer. She was exposed to secondhand smoke, though, in her life. Um, and when this happened, this was around, I moved to Paris in April of 2022, and she was diagnosed around May or June of 20, sorry, 2012. And the, the funny thing is my family, they knew because they'd come to graduation parties and everything, and they knew that I had been studying cancer and I had a PhD in this subject, so they knew for sure I should be able to have some answers as to how we can best help my aunt. And so, the, you know, it seemed like a very obvious question. Okay, well, you've been studying this thing, you have a PhD in this thing, what should we do? And it was the first time in my life that I realized that I didn't have a better answer than well, you should get on a plane and leave the country so that you can have access to immunotherapy in the US or in Europe. And it seemed like such a sad answer to give because I'd been studying this thing. I knew that the field was very nascent. It was very new and that a lot of discoveries are being made, but that 
you, she was never going to have access to those drugs in Kenya, at least right now. And so when I projected what was likely to happen into the future, it's that we were just going to have to wait, I don't know, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 maybe. And these immunotherapy drugs might make it to a country like Kenya, which is mine. It might be under humanitarian grounds. And I just found that to be fundamentally unjust when you consider that scientists like me, who are Kenyan, or can be from any African country, have contributed to those studies because we've been graduate students, we've been postdocs, we've been in these laboratories. So those are not French inventions. They're not American inventions. They're not Australian inventions. As much as, much as they are global, inventions done by global teams of scientists. And so why is this global architecture done in such a way that only certain countries can benefit at a time? It, start, it, it really started to, you know, I started to go through this whole process of wondering what was even the use of the work that I was doing if it could not be directly useful to places in the world where I was from. So I wasn't going to quit my uh, postdoc right away. I just started, this was 2012, but it, it grew this, this this need in me to find uh, more relevance to my work. I, I mean, I'm not saying people who stay in the lab and do that all their lives, it's very relevant, but personally to me, it became very important that my work become more global, more applicable, more direct, more uh, beyond just staying in the lab. And so I started to seek out different opportunities to sort of understand, well, what would happen if I wanted to go to, if I wanted to move back to Africa, for example, uh, and the funny thing is, because my postdoc was for three and a half years, towards the end of 2015, when my postdoc was about to end, um, and I was talking with a lot of different people about what might I do, you know, I could come back home and, you know, look for jobs, etc. I knew exactly what institutions I would go to, what universities I would go to if I moved back to the US. I knew right away who the researchers, the key people are with who, who are big research laboratories with a lot of funding to do really fantastic work. I couldn't name a single one. I know they exist in African countries. I know they had to exist, but I just did not know them. And for the most part, when I asked my friends, they said to me, well, you know what, if you switch to like malaria research or tuberculosis research or HIV research, you'll find labs without a problem. I'm like, yeah, but I'm an immunologist and what, do we not have cancer in Africa? Like, I, I want to do what I want to do, but I want to do it now. So then, you know, then I started to understand, okay, well, then maybe if all of us want to do anything other than these three big diseases, then we have to leave. This explains why we leave and why we don't come back. Because first of all, there's a big push to leave so you can do something other than the three big diseases. And then why you stay away is because there's really no force attracting you back. So I, I this is sort of what got me onto the journey of understanding that scientists who have left, starting with myself, are going to have a very hard time coming back as long as there are no um, conduits of information as to what exists and how to work with what exists while still maintaining my scientific interests. At the same time, the scientists who are here will have a hard time staying here if they become interested in topics such as Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, any other disease other than the highly funded ones. And when I say highly funded, it's because they're really funded by global institutions. Like the Global Fund does a lot of um, funding for diseases, malaria, HIV, um, tuberculosis, so does PEPFAR. There's a lot of international organizations. The Gates Foundation, for example, is also very interested in eradicating malaria, for example. What that does is it completely sends a, a, a disequilibrium in the system. Okay, so if you're, a, if you're interested, for example, in Parkinson's disease, and I'm speaking of Parkinson's because I have two very close friends of mine, one is her mom, the other one is the dad, they have Parkinson's disease, and they're Kenyan. But it's extremely difficult if I'm interested in studying Parkinson's disease to stay in Kenya, because there's very little funding for that. And the fact that international funding is coming in is fantastic. But the problem is it's setting the whole system out of balance because if there's too much money in one disease, all of us are going to move towards working on that disease to the detriment of others. I always give the example. If you have a vitamin A deficiency, we know that you need to eat foods that are rich in vitamin A. So we can say have more carrots. 
but carrots shouldn't be the only thing you eat all your life, right? You should also have other vegetables. So because the, the argument that usually comes back is, but these are real diseases, they are, but they're not the only diseases. And that's my actually my only point is that they're not the only ones, that we have others and we must focus on them. So then I, I figured that perhaps one way to attack this uh, issue is to mobilize groups of scientists towards coming together and doing research projects together. Because the one thing that I was able to do very effectively when I was at Curie was to work with scientists from all over the world on the projects that we were working on. We worked very well with Australian scientists who I had never met, had never gone to Australia, but we worked together, we published papers together. So I said, well, what if we get African scientists to do similar things? So that we can publish together and we can, you know, we can uh, increase the visibility of African research. Because what you must know is that Africa contributes to about 2% of the scientific output of the world. But that's for very many reasons. Some of the reasons have to do with the fact that we're not counting Africans that are not doing research in Africa, first of all. Also, African research is greatly devalued on the global scene. So they've done some studies where they show if you take a paper, an abstract, which is a summary of a paper, and you have the, the authors at the top, you give them African sounding names and you say they're from the University of Addis Ababa, for example, and you submit that to a journal like Nature or Science, they'll say, well, you know, we don't really know about the quality of the research. But if you change the names of the authors and you say they are from Harvard University, this is excellent research, it must be published right away. So there are biases already that we know exist, and this has been studied and, and that has been found. But the other bias that exists that I thought maybe I could help address was that we know that there are biases in how research is cited. So when you cite research, it it's considered more impactful, more useful, more important. Americans tend to cite American researchers because they say, you know, this research has also been done by X person in San Diego and Y person in Texas and so on. Americans cite Americans. French people cite French people, mostly Chinese people cite Chinese people more. Africans do not cite Africans. So that's also part of the problem is we're also in a system that has sort of made us want to follow these global trends to the detriment of our own research. So I said, well, so if we, if we build global communities of scientists who are interested in topics of research that are similar, then perhaps we can help attack this issue because first of all, we can come together as scientists who are interested in specific projects and we can work on those while we are remotely working wherever we are in the world. We can publish together and we can cite each other. So this, we could sort of start to address uh, the issue from that perspective. So this is how I first, when I first got out of the lab, the research lab, I really got into how do we now mobilize communities of scientists? How can we use technology to allow us to mobilize communities of scientists, groups of knowledge that are interested in all the diverse subjects of research that exist in the world? in a way that can allow people to really work together and you know, leverage technology. And somehow, I say somehow because I don't know in real detail how this was even possible, somehow my work got noticed by the Elysee. And when, uh, this was in 2017, when President Macron was elected into office, he decided to create a council around him of French people and Africans who were very much in touch with what's going on in the continent so that they could give him a totally different perspective from what he would typically get from his advisors in terms of where are the real challenges and where are the real opportunities with respect to all the different topics that exist, education, science, technology, innovation, mobility, all sorts of different topics. And so I was called, I got a phone call one day and I was told, you know, well, well someone emailed me actually and said, could you share your phone number? And I said, okay. And then they said, you know, President Macron wants to form a council. They were speaking to me in French. And at this point, I've learned a little bit of French, but I'm quite sure that I'm clearly misunderstanding everything they're telling me because this cannot possibly be true that like President Macron wants me to tell him anything because I, I, didn't, I didn't think I had much to tell him, frankly. I thought they're very highly qualified people who can tell him everything he needs to know. So it's been an absolute adventure within the presidential council because when we first met him, he said, you don't have to be qualified in anything except what you already do. Uh, and, the, and the fact that you are, that you've identified a problem, you're concerned about that problem, and you're working towards perhaps contributing to solutions for that problem, being part of the solution to that problem. And his interest is really in understanding what 
are these concerns? What are these priorities from somebody who's in touch with helping to solve that problem in the African setting? So it was, it was, it really was, a, it still is a fantastic opportunity to influence thinking, to to bring more issues to decision to people who are the real decision makers so that if they only saw thing from something from one point of view, then maybe they had more points of view. Uh, and as you know, I was already very passionate about why are we only funding three diseases in Africa? Can we please fund healthcare systems? Can we please fund the capacity of a hospital or a doctor to address the patient and not the disease? Because one thing that happens is if you show up at a hospital that is an HIV clinic or a tuberculosis clinic and you have high blood pressure, it's like, well, we are not here for high blood pressure. We are here for tuberculosis. And I was very adamant that this needed to change. And the one opportunity that I had to do a big project within the council was in 2019. I joined the council in 2017. So in 2019, there was a big event in France, the Global Fund, which was created in 2002, to pool all the international resources towards these three diseases. And every three years, this global fund meets with uh, heads of countries and heads of government to replenish the funds because they get a mass of funding and then they spend it over three years and then they meet again and then countries will pledge funds again. So in 2019, the global fund was having a replenishment conference and the conference was in France, in Lyon. And as I was in the council, this was an opportunity for me to influence a little bit the thinking of decision makers around your, your funding, a disease, you're funding three diseases, maybe it's time we start evolving this model towards funding healthcare systems. And so we did this really, really fantastic project that we called Carnet de, so Carnet, Carnet de Santé en Afrique. Carnet de Santé en Afrique translates to health journal. It's not a great translation in English but health journal in Africa. And we went to six, I'm saying we, because I formed a team around me. There was two of us in the council and we worked with, a, with an advocacy group that's an NGO to put together um, really a, a, an entire journey through six different countries in Africa, two in the East, two in the South, two in the West. And, and understand from the African context, what are the priorities, the health priorities. And in every single case, even if we were looking at a disease, in every single case, it was very obvious that if you strengthened the healthcare system, you automatically strengthened the capacity of that healthcare system to treat the three diseases that you're really interested in. So we came back with a nice report. We had a very nice uh, um, launch and you know described this fund uh, these findings to to the president and you know and, and sent the report to all these different organizations and it was fantastic because france since then has been very uh, has been very strong in spearheading the movement towards let us now be more focused on healthcare systems and maybe less on just specific diseases the good news is so this was at the end of 2019 the good news is we didn't have to work so hard to, um, to advocate for this message because when COVID happened, then everybody started saying, oh, healthcare systems are important. I said, okay, well, the one good thing that has come out of this whole situation is that it's, I don't have, it's not a, I don't have to be a lone wolf with this one message about funding healthcare systems and doing all that. But in the midst of all this, as you know, I have, I still have my project, which is very interested in mobilizing communities of scientists. Now there's a global pandemic. What do we do? This is the real test case for whether we can mobilize global scientists to, fix, to focus on COVID in Africa. And one of my biggest frustrations I remember in March of 2020 was all the predictions on Africa. Oh, there's going to be people dying on the streets, you know, because we saw what was happening. China won't giving us the true story, but once it was in Europe, particularly in Italy, in those first days of March, it was very scary. So the projections for Africa were, you know, Africans are going to be on the streets. And I was very frustrated because I said, well, what are they basing these predictions on? Have you done any modeling? Have you done, do, do you even understand? From what I've seen so far, it seems like it's older people that are mostly, um, vulnerable uh, to die. Africa doesn't have that many old people. Only 2% of our population is over 60. The vast majority of the African population is less than 20 years old. So what are they basing these projections on? And so it was a great opportunity for me to say, okay, fine, well, maybe let's do our own modeling and let's do our own predictions and let's see what, what that comes up with. So we, I mobilized right away 
a whole bunch of scientists. And it's fantastic because when we were doing this work at the time, you know, everybody knows somebody who's a mathematician or an epidemiologist, an immunologist, a virologist. And we had a full team of Africans that were all over the world. And we decided that what we wanted to do was to figure out how we can contribute to understanding COVID in the African context. And it actually ended up shooting off because we all had different interests and different expertise. It ended up shooting off into different projects. So I remember one group, for example, because one of our members is at Harvard, she's a professor at Harvard. She, um, and she, they were very interested in diagnostics because early on, you remember there was a question of testing, but there was also the question of how do you diagnose correctly, et cetera. And so they wanted to continue with that and they got some funding and they spun off um, a team on diagnostic. I was very, very interested in modeling. So we spun off a, a group of scientists that were very interested in modeling and forecasting. And we got some funding uh, from the MasterCard Foundation. And we actually, just this month, we finished that project. So we started that project. Um, we were proposing that project in 2020. We did it in 2021 and we just finished it uh, in August. Th August 31st, yesterday was the last day that we finished that project. And essentially what the, it allowed me to learn so much. So first of all, I lived abroad at that point for 20 years because I left in the year 2000. And there was a lot that I understood about the continent from having been born here but not having lived here in my adult life, that was fundamentally different from if I had lived. There's things I thought, you know, we should be able to just do that are undoable. And you almost have to be here to understand why it's so difficult. And while I was here, one of the problems that I noticed right away is we had a, lot, a very difficult time accessing data. And it's because perhaps because we haven't created the infrastructure to share data openly. So that, you know, the number of cases, the number of deaths, the number of, you know, hospitalizations, et cetera, tell, says something about the healthcare system and also says something about how much investments there have been by the politicians of the day. And they're not necessarily very interested in there being open information about how many hospitals we have, what the capacity of those hospitals is, et cetera. I mean, what I will say is that this information wasn't as forthcoming either from other countries around the world. Every country sort of battled with how to, to use this information at the beginning, but these are the challenges that we were facing in African countries. And you know, we fought very hard to have a more open space for data sharing, because if you can't share data, then you can't innovate around solutions to those problems because you don't have the real numbers on how to, to fix those issues. So the good news is we were able to expand this space. We were we convinced governments, we convinced institutions such as the Africa CDC. The CDC is the Centers for Disease Control. So there's one that's Africa-based. The original, the mother institution is American, but there's lots of CDCs around the world. There's a European one, China one, et cetera. So there's an Africa CDC which um, we worked with very closely, uh, particularly towards putting together a dashboard uh, for vaccine distributions once vaccines were available at the end of 2021 and into 2022 uh, and figure out how this can be done more optimally. So for me, this was, this was a great case study, not just for the fact that what I was doing was relevant in terms of mobilizing groups of African scientists, but also that it was relevant in a situation where there's a global pandemic and the attention for once was no longer on infectious diseases in Africa, but each country on its own. And then in that situation, we could really mobilize resources in a fundamentally different way, which I think is some of these lessons we have now to carry forward into how do we think about what the fundamental issues are. Just one example, during COVID, the first three, not the first, I think this was between April and uh, June or July of 2020, in Western Kenya, which is a region that has a lot of a high, very high childhood mortality due to diseases like that, um, dysentery, cholera, those are diseases that are related to hygiene. There was not one single death, in West, a child death in Western Kenya due to hygiene issues. And this, for me, this was so clear. So much money has been spent over the last 20 years to try and eradicate certain diseases. If we just increase the standards of hygiene and you know, in certain parts, we could eradicate those diseases right away because people are just cleaner, people are just interacting in more hygienic environments. Which is why I said, well, so if you want to talk about health, you have to talk about how people live more than 
a disease because that's not really what it's about. And I think what my crusade has now become is that we have to think of health in a much more holistic way. And COVID really helped us to understand that very fundamentally. That's not just true for France or elsewhere. It's also true for African countries. And so the opportunity came around to join the WHO because the WHO decided to build an academy um, to focus specifically on healthcare professionals and training of healthcare professionals, but it's much bigger than that. It's really a question of how knowledge circulates around the world. And when that became a question, how, because it, I was, what I should say is there are two problems that the WHO is trying to address. The first is that there's going to be a shortage of healthcare workers between now and 2030, a shortage of about 18 million healthcare workers. So that's one problem. How do we cover that gap very quickly? And we cannot build enough hospitals to cover that gap. So we have to be able to leverage technology to train more healthcare workers. But the second problem, which is what attracted me even deeper to this question is that the WHO's own audits show because it releases recommendations. For example, this is the latest recommendation on antimicrobial resistance and how it should be handled in the clinic. This is the latest recommendation on mass casualty situations and how to triage patients when they arrive at the um, emergency department. These are very important recommendations that are coming from the WHO that can save lives. The audits of the WHO show that from the time that recommendation is released to the time it's actually used to save lives in the clinic, on average, it takes 10 years, which is a very dramatic length of time for information that can save lives right now. So the question we are trying to address is how do we shorten that time? How do we make sure that healthcare professionals have access to the latest information, the most accurate information in as short a time gap as possible? And I was immediately attracted to this because I was very interested in knowledge circulation around the world. And because I also know that the knowledge of healthcare workers, if it circulates faster, that translates into better therapies, better care for patients all over the world. So this is how I ended up joining the WHO Academy. I found that the professional, the, the, the ambitions of the WHO were very much in line with my own personal and professional ambitions. And so it made perfect sense for me to do it within an institution that is global and that is helping to address this, this issue from a, a, a much more holistic training, but also circulation of knowledge standpoint. And of course, my interest is to make sure that countries from uh, low and middle income settings are not forgotten when we're talking about tech and accessibility uh, to these issues that we're really making sure that these countries are being heard as part of that, that discussion. So I don't want to go on too much except to say, I've done, the, I've done different things, some of which came to me completely uh, by accident, others have come to me more deliberately, I have sought out uh, certain opportunities. Um, during COVID, I ended up joining a whole bunch of boards uh, or committees, I should say, advisory committees, whether it's for the Africa CDC. Um, I ended up running projects for COVID, etc. But everything I've done, my key question to myself as to whether it makes sense for me or not, especially if it's fundamentally different from everything else I'm doing, the question I ask myself is, does it make sense in the context of what my overall goals are? My overall goals are, how do we circulate scientific knowledge, medical knowledge better around the world so that we can benefit more regions around the world faster and particularly African uh, countries faster? Uh, if I have an opportunity to join a committee or a council or an advisory group, that can influence a decision maker towards making that decision that helps to accelerate that, then of course I jump on it. Um, recently, I was, in, I was invited to uh, an advisory group for an investment firm, in fact. And at first I thought investments, and then I realized, well, this is very interesting because one way to influence how things make it to market is in where finances are kept. And finances are not only uh, being slashed around by foundations and international groups, it's also companies that invest in in growing, uh, rather firms that invest in growing companies. So that's also another opportunity to influence that question from a financial angle. There's a political angle, there's a scientific angle where I'm an immunologist myself. But for the most part, I think I've stuck to that as sort of the guiding light uh, whenever different opportunities come to me. And it seems to me to be a, a reasonable way to, to go about this. I know I told this story chronologically. It only makes sense now because I'm looking backwards, but usually when I'm in the middle of it, I usually just have to ask, does this thing make sense to me? And when it does, then I go ahead with it. I will stop there and take your questions. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you guys. Thank you, Yvonne. 
thank you thank you very much for your for your talk we have uh, definitely a couple of questions um the first one is about um actually who you are or who you are or who you want to be i mean um the the question behind is about the political approach that you seems like in between between yeah. healthcare between scientific between what do you want to achieve as a scientific person and also to have a weight on political issues in your country or in Africa. Behind this question again, there is a question about what do you really want to be? Do you think that you're gonna get more weight if you go into the political system or if you stay as a scientific person? This is a great question because I've asked myself that. I think I'm now quite convinced because I have been around political circles. I've seen how it works. Uh, I've also been in the scientific space. I've seen how it works. I'm quite convinced that if you want to have real impact in the world, you can do it in one of three ways. You can either go into politics, in which case you're the decision maker. If you can convince a country to vote for you or a, a community to vote for you, then you get the right to decide what happens to them. You can get a bunch of advisors around you, but in the end, if you really want to do something, you can do it. So political uh, power is one way to do it. The other way to do it is economic power. You build, you build enterprise, right? And if you build it big enough and you're really performant, then you can really influence the market and you can also influence policymakers in ways that help to uh, advance the cause that you're championing. The only other way I think, which is the third way that you can do it without being any of the above is you mobilize socially. So you can mobilize a community you can have one people march on the streets, or one million people march on the streets, or you can mobilize communities because you can do it through tech uh, enabled means, et cetera. And that's more social. So it's either political, economic, or social. And I've, I've now been more and more convinced that social, or, that we see how social organize, uh, organizations are able to really get stuff done, especially with climate change, et cetera. But what they do is they then go and influence politics, right? Uh, for the most part, they try to make sure that they can they can influence that way. I think that I have found that I've been able to sort of straddle a line that touches these different things in different ways, and I've not necessarily fully committed to only one thing. And I have found that that has been an advantage for me so far. Perhaps it might change. I'm not saying I will never, you know, do just one thing. But I have refused to identify with only one thing. So I actually had an, an entire moment in 2020, almost like an identity crisis, asking myself exactly this question. Who am I and what do I do? And in the end, I came to the decision that I did not need to define it in very fixed terms. I wanted it to remain a very fluid definition and to give myself the permission to go more into a political realm if it seemed like the thing that would get the results that I was trying to get to, or pull back and go into more the economic realm, or pull back and go more into like now an international organization realm through which I can also have influence that way. That has allowed me to have an identity that is just me and is not any institution necessarily that I represent or any organization or any company or anything like that. I, I found for me that that has given me enormous flexibility to work in these different areas and almost expand and contract where it seemed necessary to do so in that moment. I hope this answers the question. Sure, I will continue because we have um, many questions. Um, one is about what do you think is the most crucial for a complete and efficient health system? Where are African countries on the path to this efficient system? Well, so this, this is a really tough question because there, there's lots of different health systems around the world. And actually, I took some time studying different health systems. Uh, it, it's a very complicated question because healthcare is not a, a, a good or service like other things. Okay. So I cannot buy healthcare like I buy a bottle of champagne. If the bottle of champagne is too expensive, I don't buy it. I buy something else cheaper. If I go into the clinic and they say your healthcare costs $10,000, I don't really have a choice. I just pay that, right? For that reason, the health system cannot be a free market because I am not a free buyer. I am a hostage buyer in that system, okay? In my opinion, the best health systems around the world recognize that the users of the health system are not 
um, doing so with complete choice. They are not free, freely choosing members uh, or users of that health system. And so around the world, places where this has been thought of in developing the health system, you see successes. Where this has not been integrated, you see real failures in being able to accommodate that into the system. The US is a country that has fantastic healthcare, some of the best healthcare in the world, but also with a massive percent of, the, of its population that cannot afford access to that healthcare, particularly if they don't have insurance. And a lot of those who have insurance are priced out because there's caps, et cetera. So this is, fun, in my opinion, not a very good healthcare system. They have excellent health care, but the system itself has not provided the uh, adequate care to all its citizens. I think France is a pretty good example. It has um, aspects and issues. I think the weaknesses that you see in Western systems are particularly when it comes to skyrocketing costs because the cost of healthcare keeps getting more expensive. One of the reasons why that happens is because unlike other domains, Technology, when you bring technology into most domains, you lower the cost. In healthcare, it's the opposite. When you bring better technology, the prices go up. So if you have too many MRI machines and CT scans, you paid a lot of millions of dollars to have those, you have to pass that cost over to the patient. The cost of the care goes up instead of going down because now we can do more interesting analysis on your blood, on your, on your body, et cetera. So this is also fundamentally problematic. And one of the best health systems in the world that I've come across is in Singapore, where they've actually, I've been studying that a lot. Actually, Xavier and I had an interesting conversation about Singapore because he spent some time there. But the healthcare system, whether it covers everybody or not, is, is a different question. But as far as it being able to integrate the fact that cost is not, uh, cost must be controlled. And also you must control how the technology develops within the system so that the costs do not get out of control for the user. The percentage of GDP that comes from healthcare costs in Singapore is under 5%. In France, I think it's more almost 10%. In the US, it's going towards 20%. That means the costs are going to get extremely high and people won't be able to afford it anymore. So what I'm, how I'm answering this question is by saying it's a very complicated thing to develop a good healthcare system. It has to take certain very fundamental differences into account between health and other goods and services that if they're not taken into account, then you end up excluding certain members of the society and that's problematic. With respect to African countries, I think one of the countries that has a very decent system, because a lot of countries don't really have a comprehensive system that covers everyone. But one that's pretty good is Rwanda, in fact, uh, which is where Xavier and I met, which covers over 90% of the population, which is to say you have a health card, you show up in a clinic, and the doctor will treat you without asking you for money. And the reason that's possible is because they, every, there's a universal system for to which everybody contributes based on their pay, but also they've taken considerations in terms of uh, not just of cost, but of accessibility and of the technology that's available. Now, they don't give you access to all the different treatments in the world, but they give you a basket of treatments that you have access to. So I think, you know, I think that's that's going in the, direct, uh, the right direction. Kenya, on the other hand, is a little bit different. Our system is very, very privatized, which then makes it very, very expensive and accessible based on how much you have in your pocket. So we still have quite some work to do in terms of developing healthcare systems. It's a very, very political topic and it needs real experts because if they don't fundamentally understand that healthcare is different in terms of economics from other areas, from other Goods and services, then they end up building a healthcare system that is excluding too many people. Thank you. Um, we have two other questions quite close to each other. Where and when can we see the work you produce on your modeling forecasting project? Ah, well, it's uh, actually we so we have a dashboard that I just learned yesterday. Um, we have to transfer because the project is over. So the dashboard is Africa is outbreak dot africa dot cmu dot edu i can i can send it to share um so it's it's a publicly available dashboard i was doing this work in collaboration with carnegie mellon university which is an american university based in pittsburgh uh we had some engineers from there that were helping us build the dashboard um and so the work was publicly available up until yesterday because the project ended and so we have to find a different financing mechanism to continue to keep the dashboard online but we had you know cases deaths, mortal um you know testing etc but we had some very interesting pages on insights where you could combine different um, 
different parameters to get insights on, for example, Eastern Africa or Western Africa, et cetera. You could, we could, we had some really fantastic combinations. And we also had a page on forecasting that was forecasting the next 60 days, how the next 60 days are likely to go. So it is available internally to CMU people because on the internal um, uh, server it's still there, but not externally for the moment, unfortunately, until we figure out what the sustainability factor is for, you know, who's going to, well, we're negotiating right now an agreement with the government of Rwanda because our work was based first in Rwanda and then it was African in nature. So we're negotiating with the Rwanda Space Agency, which is very interested in hosting uh, the continued um, uh, public um, space for this dashboard. So if we reach an agreement, I think it will be back online and public somewhere in the month of September. Thank you. Do you see yourself, or it's not very an easy question, uh, do you see yourself as a role model or could you become a role model for young African ladies, women, maybe boy as well, men, but for ladies mostly? Um, well, I'm told that uh, I, I usually, you know, I tend to think it's it's really, I, I don't think of myself as a role model, but I see people who tell me that. And I think it has to do with just going after, you know, you, you, you decide you, you're really interested in a topic and you really, really want to understand it and go really deeply into it, right? So for me, I, when people ask me, you know, what what can I do to have a successful? Just I'm just listen to yourself because I didn't. To be completely honest with you, I didn't even know that science was a career that I could go into. I had never met a scientist in my life, and then I just sort of listened to where my interests were, and that's where I followed. So originally I was going to go to medical school, but then I was in this lab which was super interesting, so I decided to pursue immunology. And then from immunology, I had this experience with my family and my aunt, and I asked myself questions, and I said, okay, well then I'm going to pursue that. So to the extent that my story tells you, listen to what it is inside of you that is that has a fire burning in it, then I think maybe that's that can be my that that's been my guiding light anyway. I can't possibly tell you what to do with yourself, except you can tell yourself what it is you're interested in. Because actually, uh, even the next question is that one. How could a global BBA student, so the students that we have today, more than 550, how could the students here can help out yourself, even actions, I just quote, even actions, even though they're not living in Africa? Ah, well, actually, you know what you could do? This is a, this is a fantastic question. Is you can be more aware of international affairs, I think, because a lot of decisions are made for and on behalf of Africa, and they're made by global institutions. And these are institutions that know very little about what's going on uh, in African countries. And I think the movement of the world is towards being more informed, allowing more contextual solutions. I, this is the, the most important thing I think you could do is to be more informed about the world. Um, why does the world function the way that it does? Really ask these questions. You know, Don't accept that France has spent 100 million funding AIDS in Africa as a blanket statement. Really ask the questions about are we doing it correctly? Should we be doing this? Can't Africans do it themselves? Is there a place for us to collaborate with them? If you ask those questions, whether you're asking as citizens or you're asking as leaders or you're asking as people who influence decision-making, then we are going to build a better world without question. But don't let the people in those rooms make those decisions without asking them the real questions about, are we spending this money properly? Are we making decisions on behalf of others or are those people represented at the table and expressing their own needs? That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Thank you very much for today. Thank you. I appreciate very much the opportunity to speak. I hope, uh, oh, that's very sweet. Thank you very, very much. I hope that it was helpful in some way or other and ignites your curiosity to understand the world more. Great. Thank you so much. And I know that uh, you're half French. And then we are truly believe that we will be able to welcome you in person at Sergi very soon. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Have a great Thank day. Thank you. Take, Take care. care. Bye-bye.